Will democracy stand? Will tyranny continue to rule? Or will truth prevail? Only you have the power to choose. Hey, it's Lucas Scrobot, and you're listening to Lucas Scrobot Show, where we uncover purpose, pursue truth, and own the future. Thank you for being with me here today on the show, with us here today on the show, episode 188. It has been a crazy year. 2020 has been a, I mean, do you even have to say, I think that the the most used word of the year was unprecedented. It's like everyone's having an unprecedented year because it is 2020, really an unprecedented year where democracies and all countries alike, really all cultures alike have been tested across the earth by the pandemic the, 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 that's sweeping the earth and everything, everything is being shaken that can be shaken. The, the foundations of all of our systems are being tested. You know, this year alone, we have had over 35 protests against tyrannical responses to governments across the globe. And now this is not just isolated in some places. I mean, on all continents, we have, you know, in Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, China, India, Hong Kong, Iraq, Lebanon, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, Russia, UK, Spain, Canada, Mexico, US, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, all of these countries and more have protested tyrannical uh, laws and decrees that have gone out that have shut down small businesses that have that have shuttered people into their houses. Depression skyrocketing, suicide skyrocketing. We mentioned a few episodes back how in. Japan in the month of October, they had more suicides in one month than all of COVID deaths. I read a headline recently saying in South Korea, there have been more suicides in one month than all of COVID deaths. Now, I'm I'm not saying, at least I don't have evidence to say that all of those suicides are directly correlated and connected to the the restrictions that governments have placed upon people due to the pandemic. But I am saying suicide rates are rising across the globe. There is something going on deep in the core of humanity on a macro level that we should be concerned about, that we should wake up to, that we should say, hey, this this also is a pretty big issue that we should probably think of how to address. Now, Probably you and I do not have the power, the influence, or the capability to, I don't know, go to Japan or go to South South Korea or to go to Alaska or the Inuit people where suicide is just rampant and try to change society. We don't we don't have that ability, but we do have an ability to affect our children's lives. We do have an ability to treat the people around us differently. We do have the ability to build up habits and systems, uh, worldview and mindset, truth in our life that undergirds us, that guards us and protects us from nihilism, from falling into hopelessness, from falling into despair. Now, the bigger question with what's going on today is not what's right and wrong. What should we be doing and shouldn't we be doing in regards to protecting uh, public health, as they would say, and and defending uh, people with morbidities, underlying morbidities that are higher risk. It's not the question of, is this right or wrong? Are these lockdowns correct or incorrect? But there's a deeper question going on. And this question is, where does the moral responsibility lie? Where does the moral agency, the agency lie? Is it in the government? Should the government be controlling how people ought to live in the name of protecting those people? Or should individuals decide what risk levels they are willing to take what risk level 
is appropriate for them to take. There's a difference. And that's the question. Where does the moral responsibility lie? This year, we have talked a lot about totalitarian societies. We've talked at length about the Green Grocer. We've talked at length about the CCP. We've talked at length about the American versus the French Revolution. But what we haven't touched so much on is how in democratic societies, they can become and can be totalitarian as well. A totalitarian society isn't necessarily some dictator somewhere calling all of the shots, but it is something that is far deeper, goes far beyond just a single person controlling the masses. So there is a 19th century French aristocrat de Tocqueville, and he in the in the early 19th century, he got a grant from France to go to America and research and discover what was happening when it came to democracy in America. So he toured America for several months, and then he wrote uh, a famous book, Democracy in America, and he outlined five major points, four of which um, are is that democracy breeds materialism, democracy breeds envy because now you have the the ability to change social classes. So you actually are looking to your right and to your left and you're comparing, you're saying, hey, you know, I could get more. I could be doing better. I could work harder, earn more money and grow into a higher class. So he noticed that. He noticed that in democracies, people begin to turn against authority. Now that authority is not just governmental authority, but that authority could be the authority of your elders. It could be the authority of uh, scholars. It could be the authority of your religious leaders. Because in democracy, essentially what it's saying is, well, we're all equal. And this is the thing with democracy. Democracy loves, it's just their their vice almost is equality. Now it's there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. In democracy, really, we should love the equality of opportunity, but that often gets twisted just a little bit and becomes equality of outcome. And we say we all have an equal outcome. And because of that, well, you couldn't possibly know more than me. You couldn't possibly be wiser than me. Your gray hairs and your life experience couldn't possibly inform how I should live shouldn't, it, it, you couldn't possibly be bigger or better because we're in a democracy where each voice has an equal weight. So it, that tends to a, a throwing off of authorities. And as I said, not just governmental, but all authorities who say, you know what? I don't think so. I don't want your wisdom. And that's deadly. The f- uh, fourth one is there's actually less independence because, now this sounds weird, there's less independence because fear of the majority and listening to the majority and not thinking for yourself causes you to just fall in to whatever the masses are saying. So there's less independent thought, less independency of thought. Instead, we start going along with the masses because we start to tell ourselves, well, it doesn't matter what I think or how I vote, the masses are going to vote one way, and that is what is going to control the society. But the last point, which is what I want to take a moment, a short moment to focus on today, is that democracy can become tyrannical. And we've already touched on this when we talked about Havel and how he has said it's it's not to move from a totalitarian society into a democratic society. It is to come to a post-totalitarian society or a post-democratic society. And we'll touch on what that means in just a minute. But to Tocqueville, he writes, democracy loosens social ties, but tightens natural ones. It brings kindred more closely together while it throws citizens apart. Now, when when we look across the globe, we can see this happening in in some pretty significant ways. And I feel that this pandemic, this has, has 
magnified. The pressure of it has magnified the issues. So the talk field is saying that, well, it brings the kindred more close together. So why is that in a democracy that it brings the kindred more close together? Well, we have freedom in a democracy of of who we can mingle with. We're not stuck to our social classes. We're not stuck to the place that we're born, but we can move in those social classes much more easily than some other social structures and systems. And that causes us not just to stick with people in our class, but we can then gravitate to people we have like-mindedness with, like thoughts with. We would say like, you know what? I'm like you, you're like me. We stick together. We have a strong relationship. With that, the entire citizenship, it fragments a little bit and people begin to move to the edges. This is what we are seeing right now, currently at the end of 2020 in America, where it seems like the nation is pulling apart at its edges, at the fringes, at the the seams. It's disintegrating in front of our eyes. What I love, though, is what Vice President Mike Pence said during the vice presidential debates when he was talking about the 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 viciousness of both sides in the American media and the politics. And he said this, he's, you know, people, we disagree. We like to debate. We like to argue. We, we hold very different positions in America, in the world. And we like to debate that. But at the end of the day, the thing that makes America great is that we are able to come together. We are able to have a Thanksgiving dinner when people disagree with us, we're able to celebrate Christmas with friends and families, even though we might not agree on all of the same things. And that is one thing that really does make us great. But Leo Strauss wrote in The History of Political Philosophies in 1987, he wrote, left to its own devices, democracy is actually prone to the establishment of tyranny, whether of one over all, or many over few, or even all over all. Tyranny. Democracies are prone to tyranny because the masses rule, especially in a pure democracy, like as Havel writes about in The Power of the Powerless. He writes, in pure democracies that are more parliamentarian, where it's just a pure democracy, whatever the majority says goes, In those systems, absolutely. Tyranny is not far from getting its grips on a country, on a community. Because whatever the majority says goes. And as people, we tend to fall in line with the majority because of peer pressure. It's harder to stand outside of the majority because the majority or the populace then begins to say, well, you're wrong for believing this. How could you even not believe this? How could you stand against these ideas? And what we're seeing right now across the globe, that if you disagree with certain populist ideas, you are labeled, you are name called, you are labeled whether it's racist or against science, you are put in a box and pushed off to the side and the tyranny of democracy begins to rule. Leo Strauss continues in the history of political philosophies to write this, to hold an opinion on an important matter contrary to that of the majority is not merely impudent or unavailing, but even dehumatizing. The power of the majority is so absolute and irresistible that one must give up one's rights as a citizen and almost abjure one's qualities as a man if one intends to stray from the track which it prescribes. The tyranny of the majority over the minds of those who are its intellectual superiors absolutizes the disposition of democracy towards mediocrity. What does this mean? What Leo Strauss is saying, and in, in, in the middle of that, he quotes de Tocqueville. What he's saying is, if you have an opinion in a democracy that exists outside of the majority, you, eventually, that democracy will dehumanize you. 
It puts you, as I said, in boxes, it name calls, it labels. And that's not just one side or the uh, one side. Both sides are doing it right now across the globe. We see a movement across the globe of nationalists versus globalists. Nationalism versus globalism. And both sides are labeling the other side. One side, the globalists would say to the nationalists, say, well, you're, you know, white supremacist, you're neo-Nazi, you know, that you fill in the blanks, you're racist. Well, the nationalist would say to the globalist, well, you're socialist, you're Marxist. Now, there could be fragments of truth on both sides. I'm not here to argue those fragments of truth, but the point is the majority is working to have tyranny over each other majority in the way they do it. The way these movements, these these thought systems of democracy do it is by dehumanizing the opponent, by saying they are not human, they are less than somehow. And we are seeing that in, in, in media, in politics, in society, in culture, uh, whether it's from the music that we listen to, to the shows that we watch, to the podcasts that we consume, it is happening. We are dehumanizing the other side. But the antidote to all this, the antidote to all this is not more dehumanization, but is actually humanization. The, the antidote to all this is not to continue to live the lie out that we do not believe. It's not to continue to live these lies that we're saying, well, actually, I know that's not really true. I, I know some other, of these people who think differently than I do, and I'm actually friends with them. I probably shouldn't dehumanize them. I probably shouldn't put them into boxes with labels. Havel says in The Power of the Powerless, he writes this, in democracy, Human beings may enjoy many personal freedoms and securities that are unknown to us. And us, in this instance, is talking about as he lived in Czechoslovakia under the USSR and communist rule and tyrannical reign. But in the end, they do them no good, for they too are ultimately victims of the same optimization and are incapable of defending their concerns about their own identity or preventing their superficialization or transcending concerns about their own personal survival to become proud and responsible members of the polis, making a genuine contribution to the creation of its destiny. What Havel is saying here is that in democracies. There is a certain level of freedom, but as he says, it avails them no good. Why? Because they fall victim to the same movements of going along with the majority, going along with what other people think, joining the populace, joining just the not thinking for themselves, not standing for themselves, not having an idea that contradicts the majority ideas. Now, this is what both de Tocqueville and Havel are referencing here, that in democracies, there is a tendency towards tyranny because people like you and I would rather go along with the masses, which are being informed by the media. So the masses are just listening to what the media says and saying, okay, I'll just listen to you if you say it, I'll believe it and I'll go along with it. And that is the same tyranny that can destroy a society. So what is the antidote to this? As Havel writes about in his essay, Power of the Powerless, it is to stop living the lie, the lie that you do not believe and stand up and begin to live the truth. And to do that, you have to first seek out the truth. And to begin to do that, The very first step is to say, is to stand up and say, actually, I don't, I don't know if I think that. I think there might be some data points, for instance, around the the lockdowns. I think there might be some data points that might suggest otherwise. I think there might be some data points that suggest maybe we need to do things differently. And that is the first step to actually stand up and say, 
I do not agree with the majority, but I want to think through this for myself. I want to think through it and live out and walk out the truth. And that, that is the antidote. That is the antidote to tyranny that Havel talks about, that de Tocqueville is referencing. It's individuals. It goes all the way back to the beginning of this episode where we said, where does the morality lie? Is it in the power of the government? Are they the ones that are responsible to keep you safe? Or do you have your own agency? Or do you have the responsibility to care for your life and your family? When you look at forms of governments across the world, I think probably the one of the best forms of governments is actually a kind, benevolent, just king. I think another great form of government is where you actually have a, a, a set of judges that are ruling rather than a king, where judges are, we, you have laws that are made by the people, and then you have judges to keep those laws. Because when the people rise up and say, we want a king, when the people rise up and say, we want this man, we want this ideology in place, all of a sudden, the tyranny of the majority begins to take hold in a society and the majority can easily be swayed to the right or to the left into tyrannical paths. So the question remains, will you, will you stand up today and live out the truth? Will you stand up today and begin to seek truth as Maximilian said, St. Maximilian said, our job is not, is, is not to try to change truth or define truth. It's to seek out truth. And when we find it, to serve it. But in order to find it, we first have to stand up and say, I don't know if I want to go along with the tyranny of the majority or many over or few over many, the tyranny of the minority in some cases. But I want to stand up and I want to think for myself. I want to have my own agency, the own agency of my life to make decisions and judgments that are best for me and my family. Only you, only you have the power to do that. And if you do that, you can change the path and the course of your life, your children's lives, your family's lives, and you can even begin to impact and touch the lives of your friends and those you have influence with. Don't go away. We will be right back with a short Weaver and Loom segment to wrap up today's episode. Welcome back to Weaver and Loom, a segment of the show where we take ancient wisdom and we weave it in to our everyday lives so that we can be connected to our purpose and our destiny. The weaver and the loom in mythology always represented destiny. The weaver was always, the, normally it was a god or a goddess that was weaving the tapestry, the story of someone's life. And what I love about the story of Arachne versus Athena, if you remember that old myth, it was that Arachne, a young girl of a farmer, learned to weave herself, which was the job of the gods and goddesses. And Athena, who was the goddess of craft, who was a master weaver, was so upset. She came down, she channel challenged Arachne to a weaving duel. Arachne won. The point being, Arachne was able to weave her own destiny. She was able to pull herself out of her class and become something great by her hard work. And that's what we talk about here at Weaver and Loom, connecting ourselves back to our purpose, our destiny, and our work. Today's, today's wisdom point is actually a poem by Robert Frost. I was talking to a mentor this week and this poem came up and it really struck me um, in, uh, in a couple of ways, which we'll, we'll find out. But I want to read the poem to you. You're probably familiar with this poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and, sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. 
long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then I took the other as just as fair and having perhaps better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how the way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. What I love about this this poem, especially where, I mean, it's such a classic poem. You've probably heard it before. I, I, what I love about it and the reason that I brought it up is because oftentimes we are stuck in life wondering which path do we go down and we're trying to see into the future. Where, where will this lead? But what Robert Frost says in the second stanza here, I think is so telling. He kept the first for another day. He went down the second. Yet knowing how ways lead on to ways, I doubted if I should ever come back. This is the thing. When we make choices in our life, when we go down a direction in our life, there is really no coming back. In in my life, oftentimes, right now, the stage I am in my life, I, I'm I'm decades, a decade plus down a path. This podcast, I am years into this show. I have invested my life, time, and energy in it. And you get to this point, you're like, oh, should I go back and go down a different road? But you realize it's too late. You're already committed. And this is the thing. When we make these dec decisions in our life, it's way leads to way, and there's no coming back. But the irony of this poem, which is really lost to many, is that right here where it says, though as for that passing there had warned them really about the same. So Frost is saying, you know what? I'm looking at both paths. Actually, both are worn the same. But at the end of the poem, all of a sudden he's looking back on his life and he says, I took the road less traveled. Well, really, maybe you didn't take the road less traveled because both seem traveled just the same. And so there is kind of a little uh, cheek and tongue. There's kind of a little tongue and cheek being used by Robert here in this poem, a little sarcasm, if you will. Because really, when we look at our lives, it is so hard to decide which path when we're making these choices to go down. Which path is going to lead to my destiny, to the place that's best? We're trying to peer down the path but it's sometimes so hard to see. My takeaway from this, my personal takeaway from this is one, and, and we've talked about this even in the interview with uh, Mustafa Abbas, where we talked about destiny and fate and do our choices come into play. And for me personally, I know that there is, there's a sovereignty of God that leads my life. And whether I pick path A or path B, there's going to be another fork in the road where I'm going to pick another path. And I know that sovereignly, there is a God who guides and leads. And with that, there is also a personal responsibility of making those right choices in with wisdom, in relationship with not only God, but your mentors and those people around you, making those decisions of which path do I go down. But ultimately, if we go back to the beginning of, of this episode. Ultimately, it is choosing to stand up and serve truth and live in truth and reject the lies, reject the tyranny of the masses to go against the grain. And now, obviously, at the end of this poem, there's a little bit of irony saying, well, both paths actually kind of look the same. Which one is actually the one less traveled that quote unquote made all the difference? I can't tell that for you, but what I can say is that it's by choosing truth. It's by choosing to question the majority 
And now we're not questioning just for the sake of questioning. Those questionings don't just lead into more questioning, but it's to actually find a solution. It's to actually find an answer. It is to actually find something we do believe. If you are questioning for the sake of questioning and never arrive at a goal, never arrive and achieve something that you say, this, you know, I've looked, I've searched, and this is what I know is certain, then you you are not just wandering, you are lost. And so when we are searching, when we are questioning, when we are seeking out truth and questioning the majority, we can't just forever be a skeptic. We have to come to some form of conclusion and some underpinning, some rationality to understand why we believe what we believe. But my encouragement today from this beautiful poem is to realize that if you have committed yourself to a noble task in your life and you're years into it and you feel worn out, you feel tired and you're starting to wonder if you should have taken the other road, don't turn back. Don't turn back and try to backtrack five or 10 years back into your life and take another road. Look to the forks that lay ahead of you and say, which one? How do I move forward? Not how can I go back and undo the past? Because we can't get those years back. And when we start bouncing from thing to thing to thing to thing, because we're indecisive, because we're unsure about the path that lies ahead and we're continuing to backtrack, going back into the past to try to take another path, that is where we begin to squander and waste our life. I write about that in my book, The Anchor to Discipline to Stop Drifting. I write about how commitment is something that is radical. We talked about that early on in episode 24 titled, What Does Ira Glass and a Helsinki Bus Station and a Tortoise Have in Common? It's that when we keep on backtracking and trying to go back to the bus station and get a new bus line, to go back and backtrack in our life to try to find that right path that we begin to squander our lives. And what you don't want to do is have given years to something to then throw it all away, years of time and energy and sacrifice. It's sometimes hard to know how to do that, how to pivot, how to grow. But that is why we have people around us in our life, wisdom, elders, people who we trust and know who can help us see that way forward because we don't need to do it alone. If you've been listening to this podcast, if you're subscribed, it would mean so much to me if you tell your friends. Yes, it's great when you share it on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, but more importantly, if you love this podcast, if you're a fan, it would mean so much to us here at the show if you were to share it with one or two of your close friends who you know will love it too. And I want to give a big thanks today to our associate producer of the show today, Therese. Trees, thank you so much for all of your hard work that you've put in on this episode. It's much appreciated. That is all for today's episode. Remember, you are a truth seeker who goes out and seeks truth, who questions the tyranny of the majority, who wants to live in a post-democratic society where there is agency and freedom of your personal life. So go out and own the future.